Hello, I'm Sam Payne, and today I'm going to be giving a little quick introduction to statistical power. Let me go ahead and share my screen, start my presentation. So statistical power is the probability that you will detect a true positive in your data set. This means often for us in comparing group A and group B, we want to know things that truly are changing in between group A and group B. So you're probably planning your experiment and thinking, will I see the protein I care about changing? You might be thinking, how many replicates do I need? The answer to both these questions is you need to do a power calculation. We'll start by giving a little intuition for an AB comparison, which most of us are doing in our proteomics. And on the left hand side, you see here, let me get the fancy pointer. There we go. On the left hand side, you see here an experiment where group A and group B have a difference in between their averages, and they have a pretty small variability or standard deviation variance around that average. When we move to this panel in the middle, we have the same difference in between group A and group B on average, but our variability is much larger. That leads us to have less confidence in something like a t-test. Now, when we move to this panel over here, where we have very few data points, three, we have the same difference in between group A and group B on average, but we have very few data points and this gives us even less confidence. So this panel here shows you a couple of related concepts, the variability inherent in a data set, the difference between two groups, and the number of samples that you collect or the number of replicates that you collect. All of these concepts are related to statistical power. You might be saying to yourself, all my proteins are perfect. Well, what we suggest you do is gather a data set that looks similar to the experiment you want to run. It'll probably be smaller, but it should be enough to where you can calculate a standard deviation for the proteins of interest. I've got here a data set which is from the CPTAC cohort that I participate in and has patients who have endometrial cancer. We measured proteomics for lots of proteins, and I've subset a little bit of this table here for you. We calculated the standard deviation for each of these, and you'll know when you do it, each standard deviation is different. Each protein is different. Some proteins have a very small standard deviation and have tight measurements. Some proteins have a very large variability, have a big standard deviation. Here's a bit of code. If you're using Python for a t-test, you can determine the power with the following four lines. You want to set a variable which is called your power. A power of 80% means I want 80% of the time to find a true positive if there is a true positive, my likelihood of finding a true positive. You set an alpha parameter, 5% false discovery, and you guess at the number of samples that you think you want to take. 50 seems like a lot, but in a clinical study comparing cancers, we need a lot because there's a high protein variability. So from experience, we know that the number of samples has to be big. You'll notice down in the code over here, the variable I get back, I've called effect size. That's what a calculation returns to you. Effect size has this formula here, where it is the difference in between the two group averages divided by the standard deviation. Most of us don't think about effect size. Most of us think about what fold can, change can I observe or what difference between my two groups can I observe. If you do a little bit of math, you see that that is the effect size times the standard deviation. So if you think back a slide, you'll remember that each protein has a different standard deviation. That means that you will have a different observable change in means based on the standard deviation. So it depends on your measurement variability. Here's how that works out in practice. Let's say I have an experiment in my mind, a targeted proteomics experiment, and there's like four or five things that I care about. And I make targeted proteomics assays for those four or five things. In that case, 
you want to make a measurement variability, a standard deviation for each protein, and plug it into the formula and do a power calculation for each protein. If you're doing global proteomics, discovery proteomics, and you want to ask, in general, what things are changing in between group A and group B, and I just, I just want to measure as much as I can, you need to do a power calculation that captures as much of the proteins as you can. So on this right chart here, I have plotted out the standard deviation for all 10,000 proteins in the endometrial cancer data set that I was working on. You'll notice that some of them have a very small standard deviation with the measurement numbers that we had done in logged and normalization. The number was 0.2. Some proteins have a variability seven times higher. Their standard deviation was 1.4. And so what should I plan for? Should I plan for and do a power calculation based off of only the best case scenario? Should I plan for and do a power calculation based off of the worst case scenario? Again, this depends critically on your scientific purpose. If you want to do a discovery-based experiment and find out most of the proteins that are changing, you'll want to do a power calculation like I did here that captures most of the proteins. So I drew a red line at 70% up the way in my distribution. That turned out to be a standard deviation of 0.6. So the power that I calculate will be appropriate for 70% of my proteins. I put in this number for my standard deviation along with the other numbers and a 20 sample size. And that worked out to me being able to observe a difference in means of 0.55. If I ramp my samples up, I can now observe a smaller difference. When I was doing this, I plotted out the difference that was detectable according to the sample size. And then I thought and made a decision based on this. If I want to observe a two-fold difference, I need to know whether that falls on my y-axis. And then I go over and find out how many samples I need. If I want to observe a threefold difference, or if I want to observe a really small, like only 50% difference in expression, those are numbers that exist on my y-axis. And I just use this to find the number of samples that I need. That's a little review for you that hopefully gives you some intuition about how statistical power is important and how you can use statistical power in planning your experiment. Thanks.